it's oh oh I never chew black tech again because I was in such deep doo doo that I mean. Welcome to the myths and realities of the board's role in fundraising webinar presented by the Center for Nonprofit Excellence, United Way of Central New Mexico. Special thanks to Daniel's Fund for sponsoring this webinar. There are two speakers today, Ann Noakes and J.C. Bertrand. Ann Noakes is a community volunteer and has been serving on boards for over 30 years. J.C. Bertrand is the Program Manager for Employee and Foundation Community Outreach for PNM Resources. J.C. is also the President of the Corporate Volunteer Council. Thanks, Sipora. We're very um, excited about being here today. Um, this is J.C. Bertrand, and we're going to go ahead and get things started um, with the webinar and let you know what, you got, what we're planning to talk about today. Um, first of all, we're going to go through um, board member fundraising responsibility. We're going to look at the underlying purpose um, of that responsibility um, in terms of creating sustainability for an organization. And then we're going to talk a little bit about um, the board's role as serving as ambassadors of an organization. Um, and in terms of fundraising responsibilities, um, we talk about it as the, um, the board is responsible for ensuring the adequate funds to carry out the mission of the organization. We'll be talking about three specific areas today, direct fundraising and the responsibilities board members have with that, personal contributions, as well as um, ensuring an organization has access to contacts, uh, both personal and professional. One of the things we did want to make sure was clear as we approach this conversation is that um, we are really looking at it from the perspective of best practices within the nonprofit um, world and for nonprofit organizations. Uh, we recognize that every organization is unique and has um, a situation and circumstances that have been built upon a unique history um, and um, a unique course to which they're trying to uh, grow into. And so we are looking at what we kind of consider and what has been gathered within the, the nonprofit sector as best practices for high-functioning organizations. So just want to keep that in mind as we move forward. You know, and JC, one of the other things we need to talk about is that some of the fundraising things differ, uh, the approach differs from the size of the, of the community in which you live. I mean, fundraising in a very small town is different than fundraising in a larger community, and rural as opposed to urban. So I think that this is one of those areas where we really need to take into consideration each individual agency and, and what their concerns are. The first thing we want to do is take a real quick poll, and um, after you've made your you've answered it, we'll have the results in just a couple of minutes. So the first question is, does 100% of your board make a financial contribution to your agency? Okay. Um, let's, let's talk about the fundraising responsibilities of, um, of the, you and your board, and, and I'm going to talk about three of these, and then JC is going to talk about the other three. The first one we need to talk about is that each agency needs an approved annual fundraising plan. And this can be as short as one page if you're a very small organization, or it can be as long as 50 pages if you're a huge organization with great resources and a huge staff that does the fundraising. But it's very important to have an annual um, plan so that everyone in the agency and on the board knows what's happening. And this is something that needs to be approved by the board 
and um, it, it just needs to become part of, of everyone's work plan as to what, what this annual fundraising plan is. Um, the second part is to thank the donors, and board members can participate in this. Um, there's lots of ways that, that people can thank, that the board can thank the donors. And you know, there's a, a statement that it takes seven thank yous for each gift to, to make people feel really good. Um, that may be a bit of an overkill for some people, but that's what the standard says. Uh, what are some of the ways that you can participate in thanking donut, donors as a board member? You can write letters. You can give personal thanks when you see someone at an event. You can make a phone call. Um, that's sometimes a very effective way to call someone and say, I just want to thank you, and then certainly not ask for money again at that time, but just to say thank you. Some organizations have a display in the lobby with all the neighbors, or with all the donors' um, contributions on it. Some people use newsletters and have a list and acknowledge all donors uh, that way. Um, I've been at board meetings where the people come in and where the fundraisers come in and say, here's some stationery and here's a list of people that we need to write a letter to. Let's, we're going to take 10 minutes out of the board meeting and everyone's going to write some personal notes. And that's another very effective way of, of saying thank you. Uh, it, the thank you sometimes needs to come not only from staff and from the agency, but it needs to come from the board. And so this is a very important part of a board member's um, obligation. The third one is participating in fundraising events. Uh, in your annual plan that you have approved, there will be a listing of, of all the fundraising events that are planned for the year. And this is so that you can put those on your calendar and be prepared when they show up and not try not to schedule other things on top of them. If you are having a major fundraiser, all board members need to be there. Uh, if you have a name tag, you need to wear it. If you don't have a name tag, you need to be identified in some way, don't you think, JC, so that, that people know who you are? Um, the officers of the board need to be acknowledged so that if someone has a question, they can come up and ask it. But it's, it, it's very important that it look like the board is there en masse at any event, no matter how small or how large it is. Um, so uh, why don't you go on with the next three? Sure. Um, so and as, as we kind of mentioned earlier, we really see the board as serving as the leadership of the organization with regard to fundraising and serving in that very important um, capacity, um, certainly with regard to developing the plan for the organization as they move forward and identify ways to raise money throughout the year, the upcoming years. Um, um, and then also, you know, uh, personally attending events and being the face of that organization at those um, activities. But even to uh, reach those points, it's important for um, the board, and I'm going to combine two bullets here, um, but to open up and help the organization get access to um, contacts and people in the community that the organization might not otherwise have an opportunity to get in front of and to tell their story to. Um, a lot of times that it looks like personal contacts um, and, you know, access to our own net personal networks of individuals, but also professionally um, and inviting organizations, per, uh, business and other civic organizations to learn more about the organizations we're involved in. Um, if we're serving uh, as a member of the leadership entity, as, which is what the board um, of directors really is. And then the last um, part, which again we're going to get into even more, is uh, making a financial contribution to the organization as a board member. I'm going to go ahead and um, reveal the results of our, our poll at this point. Um, again, the question was, does 100% of your board make a financial contribution? Um, we had 67% of the participants today said no, um, that that was not their case for their organization. 33% said they did, were not aware um, and did not know if 100% of their board uh, made a contribution. Um, so, which is really interesting. Uh, certainly we see more and more that for best, practice, for best practices, um, 
and again for highly functioning organizations that tend to um, be very successful with their fundraising efforts they do have a uh, hundred percent contributions from um, board members uh, so that's why we've highlighted it as a responsibility okay now we have another poll does your board have a required amount for each member to donate uh, and this is usually found in a board uh, either in the bylaws or in a board um, motion um, and it probably is done every year or every other year so I'll give you just a couple of seconds to answer that one okay Um, all right, so now assuming that you've all answered that one, we'll go on to, um, to the next uh, myth. And that is if a board member gives their time, they don't have to give money. And the reality is the expectation is that all board members will give time, talent, and treasure. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that uh, if you're asking someone to make a donation, they're apt to say to you, do you make a donation to the agency? And if you can't say yes, why should anyone else give to that particular agency? The second one is that there are funders that will ask if 100% of the board donates. And if 100% of the board does not donate, uh, you are not in contention. And JC, I know that you give out fund grants. Does that apply to you? Um, certainly, I've, I've um, in my history worked for uh, another foundation in a different state, and that was a um, an incredibly important question that we asked organizations. Um, it's probably less; um, it's more important for private funders than it is pro um, probably for more corporate or public funders. But it's a question that a lot of times will remove organizations from the competition if that's um, not a reality. Um, I also just want to mention that, again, going back to the notion of the board being um, really that uh, leadership of the organization and representing the, the leadership, that um, the financial gift of the board and why it's also important is to really drive home that they're putting um, a financial gift behind what their passion is, that it's not just about um, the you know the the passionate feelings we all might have with regard to a certain issue but that there's a financial decision and purpose to get behind that organization and support their work as effective and um, as a, and an important investment okay now someone asked a very interesting question that I hadn't thought of and this is our board is a is all volunteer and membership based so our contribution is our membership fee um, does that count as the donation I, you know, I would say it depends on if it's enough to get the work done of the organization. So, um, you know, depending on what the um, activities that you want to achieve are, if you're getting all of that done with the membership fees that are coming in from the different um, individuals, then it may be. But if there's things that the organization could do to be more effective, then fundraising might be needed, and in which case that um, leadership would still, I think, come from the board. Right. Okay, so our next um, myth that we have is a token donation from a board member is sufficient to satisfy funders who require 100% of board members to make a financial contribution. And we'll go ahead and reveal our poll results here at this time. Again, the question was, does your board have a required amount for each member to donate? 20% um, of you said yes, and 80% said no, there was no required amount, which is Again, interesting as we get into talking about this particular myth. Um, so, uh, and what we've said here is that it's true that funders don't ask exactly how much each board member gives. A board member should still believe in the mission of the organization enough to make a meaningful contribution. And um, of course, we recognize that what's meaningful for one person is different than what's meaningful for another. Um, but that it's still important. You'll hear a lot of organizations refer to. Um, requesting that board members include the organization within the top their top three prior giving priorities for 
uh, on an annual basis. There's a lot of different ways to shape this, but I think the, the purpose and the overall message here is that um, when you're serving on a board, again, representing the true leadership body of that organization, that you're also leading with um, your investment and with your pocketbook as a board member. One of the things that's happening in a lot of boards is that now they are required to have uh, clients on the board by their federal grants. And this always makes for a very interesting um, uh, dilemma as far as donating. The boards that I'm on, everyone must give. And the clients give, but they give it a very meaningful level for them. And that may not be the same level that's appropriate for, or that's comfortable for the person sitting beside them, but the clients do do donate. And really, when you're on a board, no one, well, one person knows how much you give, and that is the the person that write, that takes the checks and deposits them and, and writes the thank you note. The president or chairman usually knows who hasn't given, and then she or he can follow up with who hasn't given. Because another piece that we never know is what are the personal circumstances of the individual. And sometimes people have humongous responsibilities that no one else on the board understands. And, um, and that's fine. And it may be, you may this year be able to give a very, very small donation. But again, it, it all adds up to that 100% piece that's, that's so important. And also, you know, again, recognizing that this is going to be different for each organization um, and be based on what uh, the circumstances are for your, for your individual situation. There's another myth that, that probably is, is very present, and that is that all clients don't have money to give. And again, it depends on um, what your agency does. If it's, a, if it's one of the arts or, or music and, and there's a client on there, they may have some money, they may not. Uh, if you are running a DV shelter or a homeless shelter, maybe that client does not. But if they contribute a dollar, they are fulfilling their responsibility and they're doing a good job at doing that. Um, so, yeah. So the, the next, this slide is really just sort of review of what we've been talking about because the purpose of fundraising is to ensure adequate resources for your organization to carry out its mission. And it starts with approving the fundraising plan and it goes up to donating and supporting the activities and the community connections and all of this leads to sustainability. And you know there's something that I just thought is not on this slide that you know the, the fundraising plan comes from the budget and the budget is one of the things that the board approves at a meeting and then you can see what the goal of the fundraising plan needs to be. And so really this doesn't just start with the fundraising plan in isolation. It starts with the needs of the agency, what the budget says, how fundraising can help augment other uh, sources of, of um, money, and then goes through the donating and supporting the activities and the community connections up to the sustainability of the organization. To sort of switch years for just a little bit. One of the other jobs of a board member is to be an ambassador, to get out in the community, talk about what you're doing. Uh, you know, you can talk to someone. I know people, I've talked to people in the checkout lines at the grocery store and said, let me tell you what we're doing. Or um, at, well, we'll come into a list in a few minutes. But you need to be able to talk positively about what your agency is doing. Some people say you need to be able to recite the um, uh, mission statement. Well, sometimes we get a little confused about what the words are in the mission statement, but you always need to be able to say what the agency does. And you need to be able to describe it succinctly. And then if the person wants to know more, you can say, let's have coffee or let's go to lunch or let's meet and, and discuss this further. But you need to be a very positive ambassador in the community. Um, for what you are doing, what for the agency that you're um, representing. 
and then you need to find opportunities to speak in the community. Uh, and again, this depends on the size of your community. Some of your communities may have lots of, of places you can speak. Others may not. Um, I think most agencies have local service clubs, Civitans, Kiwanis, Rotarians, um, uh, the Lions Clubs. And these people are wonderful sources for volunteers and for service projects and for um, donations. There's also faith-based groups. A lot of um, Sunday school classes or churches or meetings at uh, the synagogue or meetings at um, religious-based or groups want to hear about what you're doing and they will ask you to come and speak. I always tell people that, you know, if you've got a Civitan group in your community, they want speakers 52 weeks out of the year. And why shouldn't it be your organization? Uh, so you need to make contact with these organizations and get out there and talk and, and talk up what you're doing and so that everyone finds out what you're doing. The same in, in the faith-based organizations. Sororities, and we, sh we became very sexist and we left off fraternities, but that's another good source of volunteers and getting people interested. That 20-something age group is a wonderful group to start getting involved in philanthropic activities. And so you want to get out there and talk to them. They've also got time sometimes to do um, volunteer uh, projects. Another place you can speak are professional associations, CPAs, the AMA, the lawyers groups. Uh, get out there and, and let people know what you're doing and what your needs are. And the other thing are social groups. And um, do you have any other, JC? Can you think of any others? I mean, for always your friends and your, you know, again, your personal contacts and going back to that, you have um, always a great, um, our, our personal contacts are always, tend to be sometimes more like-minded to, to us and um, getting a chance to tell them about what you're passionate about right now um, is uh, something that usually our personal connections are um, eager and willing to listen yeah. to. Oh, that, that's really very important. These are also ways of, I mentioned the word volunteers a few minutes ago, and, and this is a wonderful source of volunteers. And there's a, a push, at least in, in Bernalillo County, about using um, skill-based volunteers. And I think that, that we need to start looking at some of these organizations. If you need a website created or a website maintained, maybe you can go out and talk to the Civitans and see if there's someone in there that could give you a hand. Um, I think that that we need to involve the community, our community, and what we are doing for the community. And this is a wonderful way of doing it. And, and then everyone buys in and, and you get more and more supporters, which is very important to do. Um, and certainly another reason to continue just to speak publicly about your organization is to kind of always be um, in somewhat control of the information that's being put out there. And one of the myths that we have, uh, that we identified is that being talked about is better than not being talked about at all. And I think we all know that that a lot of times isn't the case. Um, the reality is that um, what board members say does matter and that um, we always want to be, as board members, portraying the organization in a positive light. Um, uh, things can experiences or situations with an organization are not always perfect and th some things get difficult and conflict can arise um, but the board members are always uh, able to represent that organization and provide the leadership within the community to help um, make a confusing situation more clear. Um, I know Anne with all of your board experience have you had to deal with this in the community in some ways? I'm sure successfully. <laughs> well absolutely and I think that that this goes on to the um, thing that we've talked about in the past, and that is, number one, everything needs to be very positive, as, as JC said. But the other thing is that every agency does need a media policy. And this is if something goes wrong, there needs to be a way of addressing an issue that everyone on the board knows and all the staff knows so that you can control, if, if something happens, you can control it. Because if something happens in an agency and it makes the front page of the paper, that's going to hurt your fundraising. I mean, these all go sort of hand in hand. So 
if something happens and the press calls an agency, there needs to be a policy as to who speaks to the press uh, and then a procedure that if the, the CEO isn't available or the ED isn't available, who, who speaks? Um, and then what happens? Do you need, I hope not, but do you need a lawyer? Do you need other resources? How can you control this? Because again, this really affects um, your fundraising abilities in the community. Uh, and, and things do happen. I mean, we all know that. So um, it, it needs to be maintained or kept as private as possible. And everyone, the board members and the staff all need to know what the procedures are. It's got to be something that um, is very well known by everybody. The worst thing to do is to be watching this 5 o'clock news and hear the name of your agency and you not know about it. So there needs to be a piece in the, in the uh, procedures that all board members are notified immediately if something is going to be on the news or in the paper because that is a rude shock when that when that happens. Does that happen to you? <laughs> no? no. <laughs> Luckily not. But I think I've um, had the opportunity to be a part of organizations that have taken a lot of care to make sure that people are prepared for just for that very reason because it's so important um, that people are um, clear on how what the um, guidelines are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so one of our uh, the next myth that we've identified is that I, I'm serving on this board to do something very specific, to do X. I don't need to bother with all this other stuff. Um, and the reality is that boards need people with a variety of skill sets, a variety of expertise, and a variety of different contexts. The more engaged each board member is, the better the board functions and the better the organization functions. Uh, remember that the attorney general and the court see the board as ultimate responsibility for the organization. And it's so um, important for, uh, hold on, um, this is so important for the board um, in that it, op it operates like a group and that we're putting together a diverse set of point of views um, that are brought together and discussed to identify one course of action for the organization and that can't be done without the input and contribution of every, every specific member that is also giving um, their perspective and expertise at, on, a, um, on several levels and not um, just from, from one specific functionality. JC, before you take that slide away, let's just sort of talk about what the responsibility is of a board member and that is, or of a board, and that is to uh, be in charge or be aware of and, and be in charge of or responsible for the entire organization. And if you've got a person sitting on the board who just wants one thing, they are still responsible for everything else. I mean, you can't just say, oh, well, I just want to deal with program and so I'm not going to be bothered with all the other stuff. If there is other stuff that needs to be addressed as a board, you all have to address it together. And um, this is why this comment is about the Attorney General, because he feels very strongly about everyone in the room having um, a vote and having an understanding of what the issues are. Absolutely. So oh, we're, we're about to get a question, so um, we'll just sort of hang in there before we... And uh, we'll be here for about 15 more minutes or so, as long as someone has some other questions, we're, we'll be happy to sit here and... and um, take the questions. Our people are writing madly with, with the questions. And I'm, uh, I think this is our last slide. Yeah. Is there board insurance we should have as a board? Oh, yes, indeed. Um, you often hear people talk about directors and officers liability insurance. And this is the insurance that protects board members. It, um, if there is an issue and the, the agency is sued, and this doesn't happen very often, but it can. Um, the board can also be sued. And so you need directors and officers liability insurance. And it's up to the board in conjunction with their insurance agent to determine what the limits are on um, 
on the directors and officers liability. And this just means that if you're sued, your insurance will cover you up to the limits of the insurance. And they will cover all board members up to the limits of the insurance. Um, and this sounds pretty scary, but if, if you've got more questions, we'll be happy to answer them. My recommendation is you call your insurance agent and talk to him about directors and officers liability. Some agencies, depending on what their services are, don't need a lot of liability insurance. Others, if you are dealing with um, populations that are really at risk, need much higher liability insurance. And it's just one of those things you just carry it just to, as protection, which is what insurance is. And um, it's always very nice to know it's there. But I will be very honest at this point in time when I go on a board the, about the third question I ask is do you have directors and officers liability and I want to see what the limits are. Right. Um, is that true? Yeah, that's certainly um, I think a very common question from board, and, uh, board members. Um, the question came in where can we find DNO liability? Is it um, an insurance? Is it the same as being bonded? No, it's, it's not. DNO insurance will cover um, well, where can you find it? You call your insurance agent, and if he doesn't write that kind of insurance, he can give you the name of someone who does. Um, and it, again, the, those of you that are dealing with very high-risk populations um, need to be very sure that you have DNO insurance. If someone gets irritated and comes back and sues the agency, you're in line, of, you as board members are apt to be, in, apt to be sued. And so, and that has happened. And um, I've never had to give out a penny because I've always, I insist that a board I'm on have DNO insurance. Bonding is different. Bonding is if you're um, handling money. If you're taking money at, a, at an event or if you're the, the treasurer of the board and you're dealing with with cash and with checks and uh, you're doing the deposits and that sort of thing, then you need to be bonded. And that just means that if money is gone or, or they guarantee, I'm not quite sure what bo bonding means, but it, it's a protection against, um, uh, it's a protection against someone absconding with the money. So, suffice to say, will not replace DNO insurance for a board or for an organization. Yeah. Um, so if there's no other questions, we have a list of resources here um, that um, you can see. We've identified and you'll receive these slides after this presentation. Um, but these are good to go review other recommendations um, and to um, get an a ongoing understanding of the board's uh, very important role just within the organization but also, also with regard to fundraising. And I think as we're um, signing off, or we're about to get another question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we're getting another question. Um, just give us one second here. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a long one, so uh, we're, we're, about to, we're about to get it here. Okie dokie. What strategies do you have for bad economic conditions for fundraising? Oh my goodness. When we know the answer to that, we'll retire and, and um, you know, I think that, that you have to set reasonable expectations for your community. Um, if you are in a community that is really hard hit by this economic time, then you need to have uh, not as many expectations, but I think you need to still um, send out the newsletters and contact people and um, keep talking about the agency and, and people come forward. You need to keep applying for grants. You need to keep applying, um, talk, as I say, talking to the, the religious organizations in your community and, and they will very often help as much as they can. And then when things turn around, you've already made the inroads and you're ready to go. What do you think? I would also, you know, I would just say this is a perfect example of when the board can provide some leadership. And granted, we've, everyone has been hit by um, economic issues in the last several years, but at the same time, um, there is a way for the board to make sure that they are um, providing that ultimate support for the organization um, at, 
both you know from thought leadership perspective, but also importantly from the financial perspective, so that when things do start to turn around, um, the people that you are trying to bring back into the organization as donors that are outside of the board can see that that board. Um, was a part of carrying that organization um, through some really difficult difficult times and that that leadership is strong and that's the exact kind of presence I think you want um, from that board um, to support the organization and you know ultimately I think we all get involved with um, nonprofits because of the great missions that they have um, but those missions require funds and we can't achieve the goals and the outcomes that we determine um, as worthy without fundraising and without making donations. Um, and so it's an important aspect of the work um, and how the organization is able to achieve um, what it sets out to do and yeah. just vitally important. Right. Um, are there more questions? I'm looking over at our two ladies that are scribing the question. Whoops, maybe one more is coming in. No. Okay. Um, thank you all for uh, participating. If you've got more questions, let Sephora know, and we will certainly get answers out to you. You will get copies of the slides, uh, and we will certainly help you in any way that we can um, in, the, in the future. Thank you very much.